to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Jeff Cornish. Here we go beyond the forecast to give you the how and why on all the cool and interesting things you've wondered about and wanted to ask in weather, space, and science. And today we're talking about several weather terms that you may hear thrown around a lot. Some of these buzzwords, which like so many other words and phrases, have become what we call winter weather jargon. And specifically, we're going to cover several of these terms and descriptors that you are bound to hear, especially in the winter, and explain them so you understand what they really mean, sometimes differently than how they are applied in the media. So joining us to help take uh, some of the mystery out of these winter weather words is AccuWeather lead long-range forecaster Paul Pasolak. Paul? How you doing, Jeff? Always good talking to you here. I am lucky to be on this segment. <laughs> these that? are the big ones. These are the. This is what everybody likes to hear. Well, we have a lot to talk about. Absolutely, yeah. And you've been here at AccuWeather for a long time, over 30 years. Started out as a general forecaster. Mm -hmm. Over the years, you transitioned to more of a long-range forecaster, and now you run the show with that. So what made you uh, make that transition to long-range forecasting? Uh, well, it was kind of by default, but uh, in any case, I, I worked into it. I uh, I really liked looking beyond the five seven. I kind of actually, to be honest, I got kind of bored with yeah. the next three or four days. I got more excited by looking out two weeks, three weeks out, and seeing what the next storm is going to be. Okay, that could be so. intimidating for most forecasters. <laughs> but uh, well, we want to get into some of these words and phrases that sometimes play a role in long range forecasting and mm -hmm. big picture things. Uh, some of these phrases have been introduced to the public by meteorologists. And sometimes they are taken to kind of represent and describe yeah. parts of the weather that may be confusing. Sometimes they're misapplied by the media as well. Uh, so we're looking forward to this conversation here. And the first one that we wanted to talk about is a nor'easter. So what is a nor'easter? Uh, the nor'easter is a developing, intensifying, rapidly intensifying storm. But the the thing about nor'easter is more defined by the wind and wind direction. The wind generally has to come out of the northeast direction. Uh, it's not about the precipitation because it can be almost anything. You can have you can have rain, you can have snow, you can have any type of precipitation. We can see a nor'easter at any time of the year, although prevalently they occur in October through May because that's when the jet stream so uh, so active. So uh, again, these storms generally are, we find most of them on the East Coast. And that's where they generate, and they they need warm warmer than average bodies of water. So when that system gets to the east coast and blows up that's the intensification we see for nor'easter all right well uh, there are two types of uh, nor'easters or classifications yes. uh, and sometimes uh, we talk about miller type a and miller type mm -hmm. b this sounds like you know very much inside baseball to the public but they're very different storms some of you are going to probably recognize this the, the earmark of a miller a versus a miller b so What's this uh, mean? How do we break this down? The Miller A uh, type of system is generally a system that intensifies, either f starts in the Gulf of Mexico or off the southeast coast, and rapidly intensifies either along a stalled frontal boundary or what's, uh, whatever, and, and then s slowly comes up the east coast, and that generates a tremendous amount of pre precipitation over a wide coverage area. Generally, you can get uh, rain or snow all the way down to the Gulf Coast with these kind of systems, and then in New England, you can get buried with these systems in snow. So generally originate from the Gulf Coast to the southeast coast. And this is probably the more straightforward, iconic storm that many people think of if they just have you know one view in mind. But there's another storm that yes. we see a lot of, and the Miller B comes in a little differently initially. Yeah, now the Miller A usually associated a lot of times with El Nino because you have a southern storm track generally with El Ninos. The Miller B storms are generally coming out of the Midwest Great Lakes area, kind of associated with La Nina. Okay, and so when these systems are coming down, they don't they look kind of innocent sometimes. They don't have a lot of moisture with them, but when they get to the East Coast and they hit that warmer than average uh, water temperature anomalies that set up along the Middle Atlantic coast sometimes, they blow up, they intensify quick, and they throw back moisture into the Northeast and Middle Atlantic. Generally, you don't get much support from the from the Gulf Coast or the Southeast Coast, but the Miller B storms can be very disruptive and they can intensify very quickly. And you can often see that transfer of energy here where the interior load begins to decay. Yeah. Yeah. and the coastal low takes off and sometimes depending on where you are there's a spot kind of in the middle where you may get the dry slot and it can be kind of disappointing at times. Uh, I think the folks in central Pennsylvania know a lot about that. <laughs> we have, we have uh, proclivity for sleet in State College uh, with some of those storms <laughs> exactly, as well. Exactly, exactly. Uh, some people call it Sleet College there. Uh, but what are some of the most famous or dangerous nor'easters that we've had in the past? You know, the, I, there's a couple that stick out. Uh, the, the February 1978 uh, blizzard in New England, I was eight years old and lived through that and also the Superstorm March 
93, both Miller A storms. Yeah. And uh, the 78 blizzard was the one that really stuck out to me because I lived in Connecticut during the time and uh, uh, Boston was just buried. And the thing about this was it was forecasted very well back in the 70s, 36 hours in, in advance. People were warmed, except people ignored it. It was kind of strange and got stranded, and a lot of people were stranded in their cars in parts of eastern New England from that storm. It's pretty interesting, and I think a lot's changed with the media and the way storms yeah. are covered now and social media. There's this buildup of hysteria sometimes before a storm. I suspect it's a little less likely to happen the same way now. Yeah, and the 93 storm, I mean, that was one that really intensified quickly. I mean, the pressure drop with that storm was incredible. I think it was 30 millibars in 24 hours, and uh, one of the characteristics you need for a bomb cyclone, which we'll get to in, yep. shortly. But still, a uh, very, very intense system that uh, brought us folks here in central Pennsylvania quite a bit of snow. Yeah, and I remember this one well. I was 12 growing up at the Philadelphia suburbs, and uh, the one thing that, that sticks out to me is how wide the one-foot accumulation plus band was. It's about the width of Pennsylvania. Instead of it just being like a, multiple uh, counties, it was really wide. And didn't it snow all the way down to maybe, I don't know if it was Florida or to Alabama with I that know. system? It went all the way south. Birmingham had record lows behind this storm. It was just incredible. Tidal, tide, record tides, yeah. I guess, and everything, too. So It was a wild storm. It was. Well, you hinted at this next one. Uh, and, and I think uh, just the nature of the explosive terminology really lends itself to the, the media conversation. Now, bomb cyclone. Yes. What are we talking about here? Hey, when we talk about a bomb cyclone, it could be a storm that's just not along the East Coast. It could be over land as well. We've seen storms happen and intensify over the plain states. Uh, for instance, I think uh, back in uh, 2019 in March, Colorado, they saw a huge storm blow off the uh, front range, several uh, feet of snow and wind. And also, the, a lot of these are more common in the northwest as well. They can see big storms come in onshore there as well. We're talking about rapidly falling pressures, intensification of a storm. Generally, the, the rule is 24 millibars in 24 hours and lots of wind. And they can also influence the patterns after the storm goes by. It's incredible, causing blocking patterns. So the bomb cyclone is, like it said, it's scary. It's, it's a very rapidly intense storm that can produce a lot of precipitation in a short period of time. And they can occur, as you said, many areas. In the autumn of uh, 2024, we had yeah. one that uh, doubled the threshold, and, and it didn't even come on shore. It uh, lurked off the northwest co coast, but it, it kind of drew this atmospheric river event on the south side that hammered parts of uh, California. And like I said, it can influence other patterns, other places, not just the area that's getting hit as well. There's, they're massive. And uh, again, 2018, January 3rd, 5th storm uh, that hit up the East Coast. Uh, again, this one actually produced snow all the way down to Florida. I remember that. That's impressive stuff. Yes. That's good. Well, and I know that when we get these huge storms that can dislodge the weather pattern or whatever, this is where you guys really shine in the long-range forecast department because they can have downstream impacts half a world away. You know, I remember when this term, this term actually was created, I think, back in 1980 by two scientists, uh, Fred Sanders and John, uh, John Guycom. I think I can't, rem I can't remember his pronunciation. But in any case, it, as we went along in time, I think people thought we were kind of playing it up in the media, this bomb cyclone. But in reality, these storms have really caused a lot of damage and uh, some scary things. And there are some naysayers and skeptics out yeah. there that, that they love to kind of play a certain role on, on social media and say, well, this is all just hype. or yeah. But there is a true definition there to is. it. And there's something explosive about it. And that's how uh, it got its name. Yeah, and again, uh, these systems uh, kind of act all s similar to nor'easters and, and blizzards. They all kind of interact in some way. But the one thing about the bomb cyclones are is the, the, the rapid intensification, and they, they act like hurricanes, that developing rapidly hurricanes, but on land sometimes. And yeah. like I said, you can see them in the plains, the west coast, or the east coast. We have a quick uh, viewer question now, Paul. Uh, this one comes from David in Wisconsin, and he writes, one phrase I've heard more than a few times in the news is Alberta yeah. Clipper. So what's an Alberta Clipper, and how does this impact weather during the winter? This is a system that generally generates in Alberta, Canada. Okay, it starts over the, uh, gets momentum coming out of the Canadian Rockies, and uh, really heads towards the southeast, gets a little bit of moisture uh, pulled out of the Gulf of Mexico, and causes intense bands of snow uh, in a short period of time over a small area, not a widespread area but a narrow area but they can get to the east coast and like i said if the water temperatures are right if they're warmer than average those can also turn into 
nor'easters. All right, and uh, in the interior, we get a lot of nickel and dime type storms yes. out of that one to three, two to four inch snow events, but they can cause a lot of problems. And again, it's not about the amount of snow sometimes, uh, it's the, the intensity that it can come in. And lengthwise can cover a lot, but uh, what with very narrow areas, usually with Alberta clippers. Sometimes just several counties. Yes. All right. Well, we are uh, just getting started in our conversation about winter weather jargon with Paul Pastelock, and we have much more to come. Coming up a little later in WeatherWise, we're going to answer some popular weather myths, like can loud noises really trigger an avalanche? We'll let you know in our Is This Really a Thing segment. And after the break, Paul is sticking around to break down more winter weather buzzwords, especially one we seem to hear a lot in recent winters, the polar vortex. We're also going to answer more of your viewer questions when Ask the Experts returns. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Jeff Cornish. Today we are diving into some of those terms and phrases you hear when we talk about winter weather. We want to help you understand what they really mean as you try to navigate through the winter season. And back to talk with us about winter weather jargon again is AccuWeather lead long range uh, forecaster and expert Paul Pastelock. And Paul, uh, we want to demystify some of these mm -hmm. terms. We've been doing this here for the, uh, the past uh, 15 minutes or so. And one of the bigger buzzwords when it comes to late season winter, see, uh, when it comes to the winter season, is the polar vortex. Yes. Uh, so you've done a lot of research on the polar Absolutely. vortex, and uh, how can you help us understand this better? The thing about the polar vortex is, I think most people get wrong, is that they feel when the polar vortex is strong, that that's the time that we're going to be impacted with some really, really tough weather in the mid-latitudes. And so the polar vortex is in a large area of low pressure that's centered over the polar region. And the stratosphere comes and goes uh, for half the year. The lower uh, part of the atmosphere, it's there all year round. When it's strong, the winds are counterclockwise and it holds a lot of the coldest air over the polar region. And so the mid-latitudes, lots of westerly flow, generally milder conditions, doesn't much happen, okay? The systems are moving fast west to east. But when the polar vortex is weaker, that's when we start to see the exciting weather patterns shaping up. Cold air escapes and then parts of the globe end up getting hit with some ex extreme type of weather, cold, storms, whatever. And so it's when the polar vortex is at a weak, it's st weaker stage, that's when you have a better chance of getting some exciting weather. And I think it's impor an important distinction here because it is counterintuitive. People expect colder to mean yes. stronger, but it's a weakening of the polar vortex. Mm -hmm. It becomes a little more wobbly, and sometimes a lobe of that may wobble over us. At yeah, least the tropospheric one. And there's two levels, two types of vortexes that we're talking about. The lower level that we live in is called the polar jet stream. That directly affects us as far as weather systems go. Then there's another level in the stratosphere called the upper level polar vortex. And that is harder to disrupt. And what that hap has to happen is a lot of energy has to go up, uh, down and up uh, to get that to warm the stratosphere. When you warm the stratosphere, you weaken the polar vortex. The winds start to ease back, it becomes wobbly. So. Energy that comes from down below and up top. And a lot of times that's a better shot of doing that in the spring rather than in the late winter spring is when we have more solar heating taking place. Because in the fall, we lose the solar heating in the northern hemisphere. And so you have a better shot of disrupting the polar vortex in the late winter season than the early winter season. And we can't really be hit by the polar vortex. You can't touch no. it. It's a little bit uh, more... Uh, it's a little more ambiguous or a little more removed from where we actually live than that. Exactly. And, and again, it, again, it's one of those things where things have to come together as well. It doesn't mean that, you know, North America is always going to get hit with a cold air mass or, or the effects of the stratospheric, you know, displacement that takes place. And, and that's another thing, too. There's many types of things that happen in the polar vortex. They could split. It could be displaced. It could be stretched. And it makes all different reactions in the weather department uh, for that to happen. Then there's other teleconnection, things that all have to come together to force that cold wherever on the globe. Not always comes here, can go on the other side. So 
again, there's a lot of things that are involved with the polar vortex. Another winter weather term mm -hmm. uh, that's maybe a little bit less difficult to talk about is graupel. But it's one of those things that people sometimes see, but they don't quite know what to call it. So what is graupel? Well, graupel is interesting because of the fact that uh, what's happening, the process is that the, the liquid is being super cooled. And as it does, it attaches itself to, to other particles like snowflakes and, and snow in the atmosphere. And so it kind of gets that kind of crumbly feeling to it when you touch it. Um, that's basically what the formation is going on. Now, it may look like hail, but hail is harder and more solid right. when it comes down. This, you can take it and crumble it in your, in your hands. So that's kind of the di difference between hail and grapple. It may look like hail, but it's not. It reminds me a little bit of dipping Dots. Yes, exactly. And I know that yeah. there's like a, a slang term <laughs> called soft hail, but it is kind of... Uh, you know, it's not really soft hail, but it is kind of ambiguously wouldn't like be, that. Wouldn't it be cool if you can colorize it in the atmosphere <laughs> <true>. somehow? <laughs> Come and add some flavor. <laughs> right. Well, it is time for another viewer question. We want to sure. hear from Drew in Pennsylvania. So, Drew, what do you want to ask the experts? I got a question about thunder snow. I've never experienced it, but I've seen videos online where it's occurred. Is it a rare occurrence? Does it happen often? All right. Good question there, Drew. So what do you think? Well, I mean, it's it's two separate things that come together. It's a term that, you know, you have thunder and you have snow. OK. And, and, and what it is is basically you can get revved up. Uh, uh, the, the air can rise very quickly like it does in the spring, causes these strong cells that form inside, you know, a bigger playing field and you can get convection called thunderstorms that do develop and then it's so super cool that takes place on the backside in the winter time that you can get any precipitation to stay all snow all the way down the ground and the visibility can get down to less than a half a mile most of the time with thunderstorm it's amazing we've seen these in big storms like the march uh, 93 storm yeah. we saw a lot of thunderstorm snow it can happen it does happen people hear it um it's just basically just intensifying of the storm itself can produce these kind of events and uh, you can get three, four inch an hour uh, rates as far as the snowfall goes. And if you're tuned in, you're probably into the weather uh, in, to some extent here. And it's a pretty exciting juxtaposition yeah. of a warm season phenomena that we usually associate with thunderstorms and snow. So it does get a lot of attention and rightfully so. It does. It does. All right. Well, we really want to thank AccuWeather lead long range uh, expert and forecaster, Paul Pastelock. Paul. Hey, thanks. Great stuff. We always appreciate, appreciate your insight and all that you do here. He's the wizard when it comes to uh, the uh, long range forecast. And don't forget, when you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606. And coming up soon, we've got answers to some popular weather myths, like can a loud noise really trigger an avalanche? Find out in our Is This Really a Thing segment when we come back. It's now time for WeatherWise in our segment, Is This Really a Thing? First up, can noise trigger an avalanche? Is this really a thing? It's a popular myth that gunfire, shouting, or screaming, or lots of noise from any source can cause an avalanche. But as it turns out, it's really just a movie-perpetuated myth. It's not really a thing. So to put this in perspective, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, some 70,000 screaming Kansas City football fans at Arrowhead Stadium set a record back in 2014 for the loudest crowd roar at a stadium. And this was measured at over 140 decibels. Even that would not be enough to trigger an avalanche. So in comparison to tremendous amounts of noise by a wide margin, a much less significant weight of people or animals traversing the mountainside creates the potentially deadly release of slabs of snow and ice in well over 90% of avalanche disasters. Next, what about the popular saying, no two snowflakes are alike? Is this really a thing? It turns out that it really is a thing. Snow crystals are sensitive to temperature and dew point, and they're going to change shape as they bump into one another, falling to the ground. They're exposed to fluctuating temperatures at different levels of the atmosphere. So to have two snow crystals or flakes with precisely the same history of development is indeed virtually impossible, and therefore no two snowflakes are alike. That is a thing. 
Thanks so much for being with us here on AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Jeff Cornish. Remember, whenever you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606. Thanks for being with us. Have a great one.